It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. I'm Kyle Hyman here with Matt Kelty and Ethan Anderson. Thanks for being here, guys. Good morning, Kyle. Good this morning, is Kyle. Such a. I actually think that this story is is like made for a movie. It's unbelievable. It's inevitable. I mean, yeah, it's too bad we don't have so mo- much drama. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and so many events in the world going on at the same time and technology and and the revolution. You know, we're going to get into it later, but when you think about what Anthony Gaudi did without computers, right. without all the sophisticated construction techniques we have today, uh-huh. and what he accomplished before his untimely death, it's really amazing. It's- no surprise he was Oftentimes referred to as God's architect. It's got uh, mystery. It's got intrigue. It's got uh, like tragedy. Uh, villains. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's so inspiring and uplifting now as we are, you know, we're, we're blessed in a sense that we're alive today because we're going to see the culmination, the fulfillment of his vision. Well, and seeing this church, people have to go look up pictures of it. It does not look like a modern building it looks like something that was built i don't know hundreds yeah of years oh, yeah. ago well it's neo-gothic so it's uh it's in the language of gothic design but he was a modernist Antoni gaudi and uh but he's also a naturalist i mean he was very much into the way god designed nature yeah. and you see this in his design we can talk more about that as we get into it i you know i i've never been on the program obviously but i've listened a lot and you have a routine i don't want to get in the way of the tribe on oh <laughs> well yeah, this is going to be one of those things that like if you just like listen in the car for five minutes here or there you're going to want to go back and listen to the podcast because it's going to be so interesting yeah before we get into all of this let's begin in prayer this morning go ahead take a break whatever you're doing and join me in the name of the father the son the holy spirit amen oh by the way today is the feast of saint boniface so remember and ask for intercession from St. Boniface. Oh God, by the zeal of St. Boniface, your martyr and bishop, you called a multitude of people to the knowledge of your name. Mercifully grant that we who keep his memory today may live and serve under his protection through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays, we have the joke of the week. Do you have a joke for us? No, it wasn't part of my show <laughs> prep. I, no, actually. I looked up. I looked up architect jokes. Well, wait a minute. You should be glad I don't have a joke because I'm a horrible joke teller. <laughs> oh, that's that's actually my claim to fame. Okay. Here, bad jokes is, is our specialty, and this architect joke is no exception. Uh, do you want to hear an architect joke? You're breaking up. I'd mm-hmm. love to. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm still working on it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> of all the architect jokes that, that hurts page, that was that was the oh. yeah. is that is that true is that, is that a does that have any truth to it uh, well yeah. I, i've never worked with an architect before i don't i don't well, know like you're never finished because the design is constantly evolving and so you get to a point where you have to just say basta cozy that's enough it's done what what would we what did you say before? It's enough. Basta cozy. What's enough that? Italian. Enough. <laughs> enough. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking right. out the Italian on it. Right. You know, so, but yeah, I mean, um, a client wants to see schematics. So we develop schematics in accord with what they want. We always try to balance between a budget restraints and what the client wants. Right. It's tough, but we'll put a schematic together but we're not pleased or there are some code issues we're trying to resolve and yet the client is coming in at two o'clock this afternoon. So right. <laughs> they'll come in at two o'clock and we'll show them what we have. Now, oftentimes they're delighted because it's more than what they expected. Sometimes it's not as much as they expected, but we do the best we can to satisfy their concerns and interests. So Ethan, you're studying architecture right now, doing am, an internship yes. with Mr. Kelty here. Mm-hmm. What drew you to architecture in the first place? Uh, I've always had an attraction to architecture because I've always been fascinated with art and just the more creative side of the brain in general. And my aunt's an artist. And early on, she mentioned to me, oh, you should you should look into architecture mm-hmm. because I, I have always had a fascination with landscapes and buildings. And that just kind of stuck with me through probably eight years and then into college where I decided that's what I wanted to study. So I took a leap of faith and 
decided to go forth and study this and ended up paying dividends for me. And I really loved the the industry, the program. So Kyle, he's a Bishop Dwenger graduate mm-hmm. from 2018, and we have a 2019 graduate from Dwenger um, as an intern this summer also, Sophia Vorndren. Mm-hmm. She'll be at Ball State University's College of Architecture and Planning. Ethan, because his mother was born in Spain, from, in Valencia, and when he knew that I was going to be talking to you about the Sagrada Familia and Tony Gaudí, uh-huh. Oh, by the way, he's fluent in Spanish, too. Uh-huh. He said, oh, I've got a book on him. Yeah. Well, all my college books are in tubs. <laughs> so I said, yeah, bring it in. And um, so it helped freshen up some of my my understandings of the Sagrada Familia and Antoni Gaudi. I can't wait to talk more about it. It's going to be so good. If you're not familiar with the story, stay tuned. We've got all the details, things that if you are familiar with the story, I think there's some things that maybe you don't know about. And we're going to talk about some local architecture as well. This is Kyle Hyman. I am here with Matt Kelty and Ethan Anderson. We're talking about architecture, churches, and I'm going to get into one of the most fascinating stories of Catholic churches ever, which is currently, the story isn't finished yet, which I I like. It's, It's a cliffhanger. So thanks for being here, guys. Well, I'm glad you told us we had three full hours to talk about it because we have so much to talk about. Church architecture. Let's maybe start with why is it important that we have good architecture in our churches? And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by, if people missed, go check out Truth and Charity with Bishop Rhodes. He did a whole episode of religious art and architecture just uh, a few weeks ago. You can find it at redeemerradio.com slash askbishop. One of the things he said was, when somebody is either building a church or renovating a church, the first question I ask is, not how much is it going to cost, but will it be beautiful? We have such a great bishop. I love that. He said, not that the cost doesn't matter. Obviously, we're going to have to sure, deal with sure. expenses. But the first question is, will it be beautiful? Because the architecture of our churches, the aesthetics of it is important. So what's your take? Why, why is that important? Well, why? We, we all know, or I think most of us have some sense or, or awareness of the money that's used to make Catholic churches beautiful when there are people in our communities that are needy and don't have basic, you know, some basic uh, needs of daily life. And so how the church has always tried to balance that is by aggressively service, you know, providing services to the poor and the hungry, you know, to do all the works of charity that we can do while at the same time making sure that our churches are beautiful and if the the source and summit if if the holy eucharist the mass is one of the pinnacles of our faith Mm -hmm. then the church wherein that sacrament is celebrated should also be beautiful and it has to do with that mystical union between heaven and earth which is really uh singularly achieved during the mass right at the time of the consecration heaven reaches to earth and we are surrounded by the heavenly hosts right at that moment. So the church has to reflect some of that glory, some of that majesty, the beauty. And that's oftentimes, of course, why the space around the altar is so adorned and, and made more beautiful than maybe the, the rest of the church. Mm -hmm. That, that area in particular is very, very special. The Rorado, that, that the back wall behind where the, priest is consecrating the the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. You know, that space is very special. The church itself needs to be a manifestation of our faith in the world. So when we look at what has been done traditionally, the churches soar, they they reach to the heavens as a, it's a characteristic of our faith. It it Mm -hmm. is evidence of who we are in this world reaching to heaven. And when you look at architecture, uh, architecture at large, but certain designs in particular, the Gothic form did this. It was very vertical. I mentioned Amiens off the air, Rouen, Chartres. These are amazing churches. Um, but we then, in a different sense, can understand the power of these symbols of our faith in our communities when we think about what happened with the fire at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Mm-hmm. You know, it shocked the world. We all watched in amazement as those video clips came across the uh, our, our cell phones or our internet service. We right. saw this amazing icon in flames. And 
it was demoralizing. You know, I, I was very sad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was an ex it is an exquisite piece of architecture, and you know, we're all kind of watching with some trepidation as they think about how to restore it and what form to use and whether to replicate what was there to go back to the original prints or do something a little more daring with today's technology and maybe a different take on things, which scares me a little bit too. But, but, but these edifices do have real power to transform our lives just as a reminder in our community as we're driving past to make the sign of the cross. I mean, mm -hmm. well, I think it's interesting that you say that because there's something about us that we fear modern design almost that when we think of our great churches, we think of the older churches and now we have some great recently built churches, even in our diocese, including St. Pius X, uh, I think 2017, and then Blessed Sacrament, which you had a hand in. Up in Albion. Yeah. In Albion. It's a great story because it's such was, a small parish. Just last year. Yeah. they have been in a former grocery store for 30 years. And, and again, when you look at the limitations placed on architects and parishes by the budgets that they have to, yeah, you know, they got to pay the bill, right? And the contractor wants to get paid, the material supplier wants to get paid. Um, and so we have to work within a, a limited budget, but you can still accomplish a lot with mm -hmm. the right contractor. Shawnee Construction was the contractor in, in that case, and they did a lot to help that parish um, achieve their goals. But, um, you know, I, I use the example oftentimes of what was done at the cathedral in downtown Fort Wayne. It's such a beautiful space, and it was renovated, um, I want to say, 16, 17 years ago. Time goes by so fast, Kyle, lose track. But I was afraid because the wood carvings on the back of that altar, the Rorado, were so intricate and so beautiful, so delicate. Yeah. And I thought, oh, goodness, what's going to happen? Well, it's even better. I mean, they mm -hmm. made it even better. So my hat's off to, uh, I think it was uh, um, Brown was the name of the architect who came in from Denver, I think. But, um, you know, there is trepidation because we're so used to things the way they are, and then a renovation occurs, and we're all kind of hopeful and fearful in terms of what may come of that. But in most cases, it's really beautiful and it's appropriate and it's good. It's good for the faith. It's good for our, for the faithful. But with church architecture, how do we balance the, we like what was done in the past and it needs to be traditional and have this kind of throwback vibe to it versus, hey, maybe there's a new way that we can do things that with modern technology or just modern aesthetics, we can still effectively lift people's eyes to God and it'd be a place that induces great worship with modern sensibilities or do we really look at like this is a vintage faith and we need to have that reflected in its architecture well I think if if we think about the way the plan of a church is established where uh, someone entering the church at the back comes in and they pass by the baptistry first. Uh -huh. um, it's the place of, of baptism, right? It's it's the way we all, it, mm. for many Catholics, we, yeah. we begin our life with baptism. Um, or we begin our life of faith sure. with baptism, if not sure. at, as an infant. And so at the back our of church... initiation into the church. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a baptism, a baptistry. Um, and then we, in a linear sense, progress through the church all the way to the point after the consecration to receive Holy Communion. So it's it's an allegorical reference to life as we progress to God. We enter, mm -hmm. we're baptized, and we progress. Every time we go to Mass, we go through this linear progression to the altar to receive God um, in the Holy Eucharist. So I think it's, it's important to think about church architecture as a physical manifestation of how we live our lives in a linear sense. Um, now, there's a lot of takes on that, and certainly if you look at the Renaissance in Italy, you had a separate building for the baptistry and a separate building for the campanile. Everyone knows about huh. the Leaning Tower of Pisa, yeah. right? Well, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is the campanile, right? If you go to Pisa and you want to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you realize there's three buildings there, and they're all exquisite. They're all beautiful. And one is the baptistry, one is the church, and one is the campanile, the bell tower. And it's oh, leaning. okay. Huh. And it's leaning, yeah. Um, I didn't realize that was a bell tower. Yeah, well, a lot of folks don't, but it's that's what it is. And, okay. and oftentimes in, in the Renaissance in Italy, you know, the pride of 
you know, the unavoidable sense of we're a great town because look at how big our bell tower is or how beautiful our bell tower is. Yeah. You know, that was a, um, a so yeah, the Pisa, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is their campanile. Okay. Um, but these are elements in church architecture which are still present in many cases. It's also interesting to think about the Catholic Church in America in the, I were, we better save time to get to Antoni Gaudi <laughs> right, right, and the right. uh, Sagrada Familia. But but I, I think the church architecture in America in the 19th century in the U.S. was sort of um, Protestantized in a way. You know, we think about the country church with the gable roof and the steeple on top and the front doors. And, you know, when we're children, we make our hands. We say, right. <laughs> open the doors, there's the people. But, um, but, but that's not really in the full tradition of the Catholic church architecture, which, mm -hmm. you know, there are different takes on that architectural history um, but typically it has to do with that entrance sequence you know the baptistry and then up to the, uh, leading up to the altar to receive the Holy Eucharist and and that is where the beauty is where the colors are carefully selected um, and uh, the finishes are carefully materials are carefully selected to be appropriate for the altar yeah all right so just we're gonna maybe just do a little bit of a teaser now but we'll get more into this but Sagrada Familia in Spain. A little bit of the history on this church. Well, it's interesting because Antoni Gaudí, the architect for the Sagrada Familia, um, was a graduate of a formal school of architecture uh, in Barcelona. And when he graduated, the, one of his professors says, we've either graduated a fool or a genius. Time will tell. Uh -huh. And now, over 100 years later, we can almost without any dispute say, He's a genius because of the way he used hyperbolic arches and uh, parabolic arches and um, catenary arches. He reinvented architecture. He interpreted Gothic architecture using his own specific language that no one has ever been able to speak like he did. And, you know, we're going to get into some of the really interesting twists and turns the stories takes, but what he did with the Sagrada Familia is so unusual. Um, you know, I, I think folks in Northeast Indiana need to understand the scale and size. If you think about yeah. the Lincoln Tower at 240 feet in height and the tallest building in Fort Wayne, which is uh, one summit square at 439 feet in height, the Sagrada Familia will be almost 575 feet tall. Yeah. It, it, it is... It dwarfs everything in, in Fort Wayne. Uh -huh. And this was designed and uh, significant portions built so long ago and so long before we had, you know, computer programs and these uh, right. sophisticated means of construction. Um, you know, so for him to have accomplished so much so long ago and to have had the vision to do what he's doing, and then you twist in the pure, powerful Catholicism, which is part of its... DNA from start to finish. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it's overwhelming in a sense. Well, and I think throughout history, it seems like some artists might have been <laughs> Catholic more or less, but they were doing Catholic art because that's what paid, maybe. Seems like Gaudi was very authentically Catholic and like this was, was his passion was to create something that would lead people to God. Well, in, in fact, he was a remarkably humble fellow. Uh, the day he died, he, uh, he was run over by a tram when he was going That's home crazy. for lunch. And they didn't know that he wasn't just a beggar because he, he was not in any way pretentious. In fact, and he was in his uh, 74, I believe, that when he died. And uh, he, he was uh, living at the, he was sleeping at the church Huh. at the time but um they left him beside the road after the tram hit him not knowing he was the you know preeminent architect Antoni Gaudi yeah. and ended up dying at a local hospital but all right we're going to hear more about him more about Sagrada Familia and church architecture coming up right here on the Kyle Hyman show on Redeemer Radio This is Kyle Hyman here with our architect friend Matt Kelty and his intern Ethan Anderson uh, we're going to talk more about Sagrada Familia and Gaudi. Is that how you pronounce it? Gaudi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Pope Benedict went and consecrated the altar at the Sagrada Familia. Ten years ago, in two th well, I think it was 2009 or 2010, for the first mass ever celebrated at the Sagrada Familia huh. in Barcelona. 
and he was a huge fan of good architecture. And um, as we all remember, Pope Benedict is an intellectual, um, but he writes so beautifully. And I wanted to share this one piece. I'll yeah. go as fast as I can because I know it's horrible to read something on the air. But he talks about the second element, the strength of the Romanesque style and the splendor of the Gothic cathedrals. Remind us that the Via Pulchritudinus, the way of beauty, is a privileged and fascinating path on which to approach the mystery of God. What is the beauty that writers, poets, musicians, and artists contemplate and express in their language other than the reflection of the splendor of the eternal word made flesh. Hmm. Now that to me really helps us understand why it's important to do everything we do as well as we can. You know, whether we're making dinner for our family, hmm. cutting the grass, you know, or doing architectural design for church, we should do it as well as we possibly can to reflect God's own great glory, right? And uh, what Antoni Gaudi accomplished at the Sagrada Familia has, nobody has ever been able to replicate the style of his architecture. When you see it, it looks like an organic piece where there are columns which might also be bones and mm. sinew. And there are pieces done in a way that you've never seen columns inside the church, which then sprout limbs because right. he was such a student of nature. And um, he said, God is a builder. Mm -hmm. um, the architect is a, the, the tree is one of God's buildings. And so you see a lot of this in the Sagrada Familia. Um, the Sagrada Familia is, as I mentioned uh, in one of the preceding segments, it, it's overwhelming because there's so much there. There's beauty and the way light filters in, the way uh, this, the, the volumes inside are created. There's so much written on in the facade where each facade has a name. So there is the nativity facade in which you'll see the story of the nativity and all of the joyful mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Mm. And then there is the um, glory facade where each of the columns represent one of the seven sacraments and each of the uh, columns at the top have the virtues. And then at the bottom, the seven deadly sins, of course, what is down low being more base and you know what is up high, closer to heaven being more holy. Uh -huh. um, but if you went on a walk around this church with someone who understood all of the references, allegorical and literal, in the church facade, you could spend several days and you would learn much of the Bible. But that isn't, that's really in keeping with Catholic architecture through the ages. And we think of medieval architecture when very few people could read. And even if they could read, there weren't Bibles in print handy, you the know. Printing press. Right. Yeah, right. But people knew the Bible because when they went to church, all of the stories of the Bible were told in fresco cycles, like Giotto's stories on the side of the church wall on the inside. So you knew the Bible. Right. Not because you had read it, but you'd been to Mass every day. You had seen the stories painted on the side of the church walls. This is like the, the, Sagra the Sagrada Familia, where if you walk around the exterior, you have all of the mysteries of the Holy Rosary. You have our catechism is in the architecture. There's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of allegorical reference, and there's a lot of just beautiful sculpture, uh, literal storytelling, if you will, in that sense. But that's the way great architecture should be. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Allen County Courthouse, it is the story of justice. In, it's both written in the stone, and then there are, there's a lot of allegorical figures in the pediments which tell the story of justice. The Sagrada Familia, and many Catholic churches do this. I'd like to think every Catholic church does this in some way, in some ways more subtle or more obvious, bigger or smaller. Um, and I, I believe that most architects are thinking about this as they're doing their designs. And if you talk to Father Bill, Monsignor Bill Schooler at St. Pius X in mm -hmm. Granger, he would help you understand that architecture right. and why the architecture of that church reinforces our faith in ways we don't even know, whether it's that linear progression we talked about earlier with the baptistry at the entrance as we make our linear progression through life to God, a la receiving the Holy Eucharist each time we go to Mass, um, or whether it's uh, the seven sorrows of Mary in certain elements at the back of church. Our architecture should help reinforce our faith and 
I think we're, we're blessed. It, it does in most of our Catholic churches. Yeah. Um, you, you may have to look harder in some cases to find it, but it'll be there. And with Sagrada Familia in particular, you mentioned a lot of different visual things. Uh, one of the things that I think we want to talk about and get into in the next segment is the history of this construction. And then you mentioned that Gaudi gets hit by a train and dies before its obvious completion. Probably wasn't going to be completed in his lifetime anyway. But with that is like, how do we continue this without the architect? And then the plans get destroyed, which adds another plot twist. Well, yeah. So there was a gentleman who wanted to have a church built in Barcelona, a church of expiation. And and he commissioned an architect, I'm just struggling to remember his name, but he resigned the commission after one year, which is when 31-year-old Antoni Gaudí stepped in and with permission changed the design fundamentally. Uh-huh. And this was the most significant commission of his life. Yeah. It was his life's work. He had other work he did, which we hope to have a moment to talk about, but he knew and it wasn't uncommon. You know, this has been going, the construction was going on for 130 years, but many Gothic cathedrals took hundreds of years to build. Right. So we'll talk about how he ensured that it would get done after you tell me, like, okay, I got to stop talking now. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to it. That's all coming up here on the Kyle Heim Show on Redeem Radio. This is Kyle Hyman here with local architect Matt Kelty, also with architectural student Ethan Anderson. Been talking about Sagrada Familia in Spain, the architect behind it all, and Anthony, 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 Anthony Gaudi. Gaudi. Yeah, and I think we probably should put a bow on what we're talking about before the break, and then I wanted to ask Ethan a quick question. Yeah. But but um, before I ask Ethan that question, so the Sagrada Familia began as a church of expiation. Um, the original architect resigned the commission. Antoni Gaudi stepped in. Once he showed his conceptual ideas for how the church should be designed and built, they gave him the commission, permitted him to change it radically, and he set about its construction. Um, but then in 1936, as part of the Spanish Revolution, anarchists broke in. This is after Gaudí's death. Mm -hmm. Now, Gaudí knew that this would not get done during his lifetime, which yeah. was not unusual. I mean, my goodness, uh, Chartres took hundreds of years mm -hmm. to build. Um, so you would have five or six generations of Masons all working on the same uh, church or, or more. So what Gaudí did was he built models, very detailed models, and had a lot of drawings and sketches so that after he died, work could continue. This was the preeminent work of his life. Yeah. He had dedicated his life to this. So he died in 1926. In 1936, as part of after the Spanish Revolutionary War broke out, anarchists broke in. And uh, these were a lot of anti-Catholic bigotry, and they just they lit a fire in the basement, the crypt uh, of Sagrada Familia, uh, Familia, and torched all of the drawings, shattered the models. So after the fire was put out, they went in and began putting the models back together. They did have some other sketches that were not there that weren't destroyed, uh, but. Still to this day, they haven't really put all of the models back together, Yeah, but they put enough back together. They knew what Gaudí wanted to accomplish here. Um, and if anybody goes to a website and, or just to Google and they just type in, La, uh, or just type in Sagrada Familia, um, you'll get a lot of sources. And the more you see, I think the more drawn in you'll become because this is unlike any architectural piece you've ever seen it, it is so overwhelming so beautiful and so dedicated to god uh, the tower of mary uh, the tower of christ the tower of the evangelists i mean every element has an allegorical meaning it's a symbol for something in our catholic faith we're sitting here with ethan anderson uh -huh. who just finished his freshman year at uh, university of miami in florida school of architecture bishop dwenger class of 2018 and we're talking about this neo-Gothic piece of architecture. And young people, Ethan, they're so caught up in what's new, cutting edge, avant-garde. Where's the future of our practice going? So when you see the Sagrada Familia and see what Antoni Gaudí did, I mean, how do you see it? I, I really just think of it as 
otherworldly, to be quite honest, because, well, I, as a Catholic, I've been in numerous churches in the diocese and elsewhere in the world. Oh, and I, didn't, I didn't mention the fact that Ethan's mother was born in Valencia. Uh, so, you know, Ethan, by the way, is fluent in Spanish. He's yeah. surprised the heck out of me one time where he just flew into Spanish. Yeah. Um, so you have roots. You've been back to Spain every year. I have, yes. Yeah. We try and go every summer just to reconnect with the family, my mom's side. And yeah, I would just say like growing up, I, I've been in numerous churches. And to be quite honest, as, as a youngin, I didn't really think much of it. I just thought, oh, it's another church, whether yeah. it's a massive European cathedral or St. Elizabeth Ann Seat in my current parish. Uh -huh. But walking into La Sagrada Familia when I was there in 2014, which was, to me was kind of the threshold of adolescence and beginning to learn to appreciate art. Yeah, and you start to think about things a little bit yeah. more. And, yeah. yeah. So we, we were waiting in line for two hours because it is the most visited monument in Spain, which really goes to show how important it is because Spain's number one industry is tourism. Hmm. So to be the number one monument visited in one of the most visited countries in the right. world is pretty spectacular. Yeah. You walk in and these massive tree-like columns just, you follow them up to the ceiling and it just never ends. Yeah. And then you reach the ceiling and it's, like Matt mentioned, it's these bone-like structures. You're really not sure what material they're exactly made out of because it just does not seem like any regular church. Granted, it does have the overall, the very traditional shape of Gothic churches, the general cross-like shape and the columns that obviously support the vaulted ceilings. But it just seems so otherworldly and... Just the way that the light filters in through the stained glass, it even it adds to the whole picturesque scene of the the beautiful magnum opus of Antony Gaudi. And when I was doing a little bit more research last night, I I was reading about this one young architect who joined the architecture team in in the eighties. And he was he was a young guy, probably twenties, thirties, out of school, and they had him they had him doing what most of the other architects were doing, which was trying to figure out how Gaudi designed this church, which uh -huh. after the plans were destroyed was very hard. And granted, 40, 50 years after those plans were destroyed, they still hadn't made much progress. So, so this guy, it took him about a year just to figure out the detailing for one singular window. Yeah. That's how lost they were. And how intricate this. his designs, how intricate Gaudi's designs were. Yeah, exactly. It, it just comes to show how, how complicated the design was. And, and then this guy whose name is escaping me right now, he had, he had a moment of wisdom, I would say. Eureka moment. Yeah. A Eureka moment. And he, he had one of those, one of those moments that we were talking about where, where young people are thinking, all right, so what's the next big thing? What's the next technology? Or what are people doing nowadays? What's the next big thing? And he thought it came to him that the latest technology of that day was airplane software or airplane designing software. So he utilized that software to basically come up with a decent amount of the interior space, the ceilings. And I think the fact that they had to go as far as airplane designing software yeah. just comes to show how intelligent Antony Gaudi was and how detailed and just how incredible this church is. Well, and maybe you can share a little bit about his process of designing the arches and how he was using... Yeah, the, the catenary arch <laughs> is, is common in a lot of what Antony Gaudi did. And the catenary arch is, if you were to hang a chain, let's say, uh -huh. or a, a heavy rope from... Uh, from a beam uh -huh. and you attach the two ends of the rope, it would then hang down, right? But it wouldn't be a true hemisphere. It would not be a half circle right? because the weight of the element itself makes it sag. It's called a catenary arch. And it's, it's also, by the way, the most efficient load-bearing structure, not a true hemispherical gravity-driven, well, it's gravity-driven, but not a true hemisphere, not uh, that 
pure neoclassicist half circle, uh -huh. but rather a, a catenary arch is the most efficient. And you'll see this often in a lot of not just Gaudi's work, but other architects who were in this era. We haven't even talked about Guastavino yet. <laughs> I mean, these, I tell you what, these uh, architects from Spain have really radically changed Western architecture in some ways. Um, but he used these catenary arches as ways to understand the resolution of vertical loads so that he could design. And really, this is the catenary arch hangs down. And he built a series of catenary arches really from the bottom of the first floor framing in his basement. Hmm. And if and then he put a mirror on the floor to understand how it would look in the vertical, not hanging down, but rather upright. Right. So that's really the genesis of how these catenary arches and this design for the Sagrada Familia came, came to be. You know, we're talking about architecture and Gaudi and his style. You know, we had uh, the, the, the Romanesque and then the Gothic and then the Renaissance. And, and then we had the uh, Baroque and the Rococo. And then we have Gaudi. I mean, it's, it's, hmm. he, he is, I mean, the word, if we say something is gaudy, we, th we think of it too highly ornamented sometimes. Is that where that comes from? So where it comes from. Oh, it is? Well, I mean, it, it's, Interesting. it's, it's, an ex you know, you just ex extend yeah. the style of his architecture, which is so highly adorned, yeah. you know, and so intricate and so elaborate and so highly textured. It's Gaudi, you know, yeah. it's what it is. And it's beautiful, right? Yeah. I mean, when you understand the depth and the layered meaning of his designs, it is really what architects strive for. It is the highest level of our ability to practice, where he was designing both the structure and all of those allegorical meaning into the, the, the very bones of the church. It's, very, it's inspirational to most architects, uh, any piece of architecture that has this much layered meaning in it. And obviously, this church is going to be and is one of a kind. <laughs> There's not going to be anything like this ever again. Will Are there parts of it, components of it, that, that can be duplicated in our churches? Is, will this become a new style? Like you're, you're kind of explaining it as a new style of church design. Do you think we'll see? I don't. I don't like because replica, it, like miniatures of this. It's like trying way? to replicate Mozart. Hmm. I mean, you can follow some of the thematic elements in what how Mozart put music together, perhaps, but you're not going to be Mozart, yeah. right? And it's not as though other architects have not been similarly inspired by nature, by God's own design. Mm -hmm. Frank Lloyd Wright was, and several of his students were also. Um, uh, you know, so. While we may never see Antoni Gaudi again, that kind of architecture, we can see elements of it. Um, anytime an architect tries to make a structure more sinewy, more flesh-like, you know, with bones and tendons and sinews, you're gonna you're gonna say, "Oh, that reminds me of Antoni Gaudi at La Sagrada Familia," or um, some other piece of his architecture where these other similar characteristics are present, but. There was a great debate back in the 40s and 50s about whether or not the Sagrada Familia should be finished. Because, you know, Le Corbusier said, uh -huh. hey, we don't know what he wanted, really. We have this model you guys have kind of put back together again, uh -huh. but, but then it wasn't well re uh, The model hadn't been put back together. And, and the Katia software that uh, Ethan mentioned hadn't been developed and wasn't being used. So they were really struggling to try and figure out what Gaudi wanted in some major portions of the Sagrada Familia. So the debate was, leave it, leave it as a testament to Gaudi, but don't go forward because you won't do it right. Hmm. Well, it was never a testament to Gaudi. It was a testament to our faith. It was a testament to God. It was a testament to the talent that God had given the Masons who, you know, architects think we're great because we do designs, right? We don't build buildings. Contractors build buildings, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's important to... Uh, Remember Gaudi's humility in all of this. And I believe if Gaudi were present, hopefully they're, they're hoping that the Sagrada Familia will, be fin Familia will be finished in 2026. Yeah. The centenary of his death. Yeah. Um, if he were there, I think he would be weeping with joy, really. Yeah. It may not have been every detail exactly like he wanted, but his vision was, was completed yeah. uh, to the best of our ability, right? And the best we can do. There is a video that I'm going to share in the show notes. I'll put it on social media and stuff too that people have to see. It's a 
uh, digital 3D rendering of the completion of this in its many stages. And it goes on and on and on with these towers and towers and towers and towers and steeples. And, and like, this is, it looks, it looks like fiction. I it's, mean, it looks like science fiction. Like, they're not actually going to do this, but that's... Do you, you know how playing. at a fireworks finale, <laughs> yes. you think it can't get any better, right. and then it just gets better? Yeah. And you're like, you're just, oh my goodness, sensory overload, right? Yeah. That's Sagrada Familia. Familia. Yeah. I mean, that's his architecture. As you watch that animation, really? Another tower? Right. Another spire? Right. It gets bigger and right. bigger and bigger? Oh my word! It is. It's stunning. So good. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. Check out Sagrada Familia. Thank you, Matt Kelty. Thank you, Ethan Anderson, for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you so much. Thank you.